Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Will Cooper and I work with the MSP430 team at Texas Instruments. This section of the MSP430 FR4X and MSP430 FR2X MCU Overview Workshop will cover key peripheral highlights. As you can see, in this portion of the training, we will be going over our new LCD module that is both low power and extremely flexible, the onboard ADC, IR modulation logic that is making coding easier, and I'll give you a look at the input and output pins in these new series. This slide shows a simplified version of the structure of a segmented LCD display. Essentially, it consists of two polarizers rotated 90 degrees from each other to polarize light coming into the display and a reflective backing to reflect light that gets through. In between the layers, there are liquid crystals with electrodes to apply a charge. If the segment is off or gray, there's no charge applied. In this normal state, the liquid crystals have a twisted structure that will turn the light 90 degrees. So light comes in the first polarizer and comes out all in one direction. Then the crystals turn the light 90 degrees, which allows the light to pass through the second polarizer. Then light reflects off the backing and does everything again in reverse, passing back out the front of the display. This makes the segment just look gray because most of the light is being reflected back out. If the segment is on, or black, there is a charge applied across the crystals in this segment. When a charge is applied, it causes the crystals to untwist, so this time the light goes through the first polarizer, but this time the crystals do not twist it. They just let it go straight to the next polarizer, where the light is all blocked because it is still 90 degrees from the second polarizer. Because the light cannot get through, it doesn't make it to the reflective backing and is just absorbed, making the segment look black. LCDs must be driven with AC signals. A DC level on an LCD segment will damage the LCD. The MSP430 LCD module generates the alternating current waveforms automatically. The RMS voltage presented to an LCD segment determines whether it is on or off. The example waveforms here show resulting waveforms of both an on and off segment. The on segment has a much larger RMS voltage on the segment than the off segment. Note that both segments have waveforms that have net zero DC voltage, but the RMS voltage on the on segment is higher, causing the segment to turn on. The FR4133 supports up to 256 segments using the LCDE module. It can drive up to eight comm lines and is functional even in LPM 3.5. In software, each LCD pin is configurable as seg or comm. There is also capability for individual segment blinking using a separate blink memory for two to four MUX displays and an internal charge pump up to 3.44 volts for internal voltage generation. This helps enable contrast control by software even when the MSP430 is in low power modes. The LCDE is designed to be the lowest power LCD module, particularly running in LPM3 and LPM3.5. As you can see, the current consumption for keeping the LCD and RTC running in these low power modes has been significantly reduced. This can have a huge impact on battery life for LCD applications. As mentioned before, the LCDE module helps to enable easy LCD layout. On earlier MSP430 devices with LCD, the pins on the MSP430 corresponding to the comm lines were fixed. This meant that specific pins on the MSP430 had to be connected to the specific COM line pins on the LCD display. With FR4X, any LCD capable pin on the device can be configured as either COM or SEG. This means that you can have a wide range of pin options for connecting the COM lines, making layout much easier. This also means that if a layout mistake is made where the COM is connected to the wrong pin, this can easily be fixed in software. Let's look at some layout and software considerations. Choosing the right display and carefully choosing which MSP430 pins you want to connect to which pins on the display can make a big difference in the ease of use of your code and its efficiency. This ties into how the display muxes different areas together onto the same seg pin in relation to what types of things you will be displaying on it, in example characters or numbers, and it also relates to the way the MSP430 LCD memory is structured in different mux modes. Here's an example. 
As you can see on this format's display, to be able to make all the digits 0 to 9, you only need to use two pins. Next, we need to choose a set of LCD pins on the MSP430 to correspond to these two segment pins on the LCD. Please note the memory layout of the LCD registers. In 4 MUTs mode, each segment pin corresponds to one nibble of the register, so the best option in this case is to put both the LCD pins 1 and 2 that we need to create the digit on the MSP430 LCD pins that share the same LCD memory register. This way, we can do a single byte access to write the whole digit instead of having to handle doing two separate accesses where we'd have to be careful not to alter the other nibble of the register. Now we'll take a look at another module on the MSP430 FR4X and MSP430 FR2X MCU series. The 10-bit ADC is similar to ADC 10 modules on earlier MSP430s. It can run at up to 200 kilosamples per second with 10 channels. It operates in single channel, sequence of channels, and repeated modes, and has selectable software and hardware triggers, like the timer. There is also a window comparator to help do some handling of results without waking the part, which we will discuss in the next couple slides. This ADC module has a window comparator similar to the one on the MSP430 FR5969 ADC. The window comparator automatically does some of your data handling for you in hardware. Basically, it automatically checks the ADC results against thresholds that you can configure in hardware. Based on which range the data falls in, it will set different flags. There are three ranges, high, in, and low, which are set based on where the result is in relation to the thresholds. This can let you stay in LPM modes unless the ADC result falls into your range of interest. Let's quickly step through how this works. The ADC reads a sample that is in between the two thresholds and sets ADC in IFG. The ADC then reads a sample that is above the high threshold, so ADC high IFG is set. Then the ADC reads a sample that is in between the two thresholds and sets ADC in IFG. Next, the ADC reads a sample that is below the low threshold, so ADC low IFG is set. Then the ADC reads a sample that is still below the low threshold, so ADC low IFG is set again. The ADC and PMM also feature an internal temperature sensor that is provided to one of the ADC channels for measurement. On the FR4X, and FR2X series, one thing to note is that you need to enable the temperature sensor in the PMM module. This temperature sensor, again, is similar to what you may have used on other MSP430 devices, but because it is something that we are frequently asked about, I wanted to go into a little more detail. There are calibration constants in the device TLV structure that can be used with the internal temperature sensor to get a more accurate reading and get you within a few degrees of the actual temperature. These calibration values are generated per unit at production. Basically, the measurement on the ADC is taken in a temp chamber at 30C and 85C using the internal reference, and then these two values are stored in the TLV area. You can then use these values to do a two-point calibration. Basically, you plot these two points on a graph of temperatures versus ADC readings, then find the equation for the line between two points. This is in the form y equals mx plus b, where m, the slope, is found by subtracting the two temperatures and dividing the difference in the ADC readings. Then the offset b is 30c, because we are passing through the 30c point. So now, when you take a reading on the ADC temperature sensor in an application, you're going to plot it on a line by plugging the ADC reading into the equation as x. You will then be able to calculate the temperature value along that line that corresponds to the reading. Code examples and our driver library are available to help make this even simpler. I would like to pause here and give another note. On many MSP430 devices, there's an internal connection with a divider providing VCC over 2 to one of the internal inputs of the ADC to allow the user to measure the battery voltage. On the MSP430 FR4X ADC, this is still possible, but instead the VREF voltage is fed to an input channel internally. If you measure this input with DVCC as a reference, 
You can then determine the DVCC voltage by plugging in the known 1.5 volts for the VREF into the equation. To sum it up, on the FR4X and FR2X series, when you use the ADC, there are a few modules that may be involved, not necessarily just registers in the ADC that need to be set up. I wanted to highlight this because it's a little different than other MSP430 devices. If you use the internal reference or the temp sensor, these have to be enabled in the PMM module. Then, of course, there are the normal ADC settings like sampling time and channel. These would be set up in the ADC module itself. You also need to have your clock system set up for the clock you want to use as your ADC clock source. If you're triggering from a hardware trigger, like a timer, you'll need to set up the timer as well. Finally, the SIS module is used to enable analog pin function for GPIOs. Let's take a look at something totally new in these series, the IR modulation logic. The SIS module includes this logic that can be used to easily generate accurately modulated IR waveforms, such as RC5 data format, directly on an external pin. This function has two different PWM input signals to support either ASK or FSK modulations. The IRM select bit in the sysconfig1 register specifies the selected mode. The IR modulation function can be used with data generated by either hardware or software. In hardware data generation, the data comes from the EUSKI A or EUSKI B module, and the 8-bit data is automatically serially sent. In software data generation, the IR data bit in the sysconfig1 register is used to control the logic 0 or 1 to be sent. In ASK modulation, you are typically generating one carrier frequency and an envelope that controls whether the carrier is on or off to indicate zeros and ones. There are a couple of different protocols that can be on top of this. The signal is generated in FR4X and FR2X using one timer for generating the carrier frequency. Then for generating the envelope, a second timer can be used or the Uski module transmit buffer or the IR data bit in the sysconfig register for a software controlled approach. For FSK modulation, you are generating a signal that switches between two different frequencies to indicate zeros and ones. Again, there can be a few different protocols on top of this. The two different frequencies can be generating using the two timers in the device to set up as PAWMs. Then the data can be added to switch between the two frequencies using the Uski module transmit buffers or the IR data bit in the sysconfig register. This example shows a picture of the basic setup for ASK modulation. This example is using TA0 to generate the carrier and TA1 to generate the envelope. As you can see, TA0 CCR2 is set up as a PWM for the carrier waveform at a much higher frequency than TA1 CCR2. TA1 CCR2 signal generating the envelope is anded with the TA0 CCR2 carrier to produce the waveform at the right. There are many other ways to configure the IR generation according to your needs for encoding and resources available. This is just one example. Finally, let's look at the I.O. Very few other devices with a similar memory footprint offer the I.O. functionality of the FR4X and FR2X devices. Up to 60 GPIOs are available on the 64-pin package device, all fully muxed with different functions including LCD, ADC, and more. The only pins that are dedicated are supply pins and spy-by-wire. Another great feature of these devices is that all of the I.O. pins are capacitive touch enabled. There is internal circuitry that will form an oscillator with the external capacitive pad. Internally, this oscillation is fed back into the timer modules, which can measure the frequency. The capacitive touch library and tools like TouchPro GUI are available to help make developing a touch application easier. One quick note on the I.O., like the MSP430 FR5969, by default all digital I.O. are set into a low power state after a brownout reset. This helps reduce inrush current at startup and keep power low. Because of this, at startup, when you initialize your GPIOs, you need to clear the lock LPM5 bit to enable the GPIO pins to take whatever functions you've configured. Another important note is that if you're migrating from another MSP430 device, we now have the sysconfig registers, which are a new feature on this device. 
These registers are used to configure device-specific settings. This includes FRAM write protection, as well as IR modulation, ADC analog pin selection, and LCD power pin selection that were referenced earlier in the segment of the workshop. Thanks for watching the key peripherals segment of the MSP430, FR4X, and FR2X MCU Overview Workshop. Tune into the fourth and final segment to learn about the comprehensive ecosystem of development tools and software available to jumpstart your designs.